On behalf of the trustees of the Paul Pratt Memorial Library, welcome to the final event of our 2013 Sunday Author Talk program. I'm Mary Lou Lawrence, a trustee of the library, and I do promise to be brief in these introductory remarks. Before I introduce Mr. Lahane, though, I want to acknowledge the people who have made our author series successful this year. It takes a lot of time and vision to make a program like this happen. So thank you to the members of the library's program committee who worked tirelessly all year on these events. And to our generous sponsors, Dean and Hamilton, Dean and Hamilton Realtors and the Cook Estate who made this series possible. And to Bruce Sinclair, owner of A Taste for Wine and Spirits, who for two years now has donated all the wine for our post-talk receptions. And most importantly, thank you to the authors who leave their families on Sunday afternoon to come here at their own expense. They come to us with their gifts of language, of wit, insight, stories, and knowledge. They bring us together as a community. They stir up our thoughts. They kindle our imaginations. And they leave something of themselves behind with us. This year, 2013, marks the 10th anniversary of Paul Pratt Memorial Library's new home on Ripley Road. Today, our library is not simply a hushed, silent place of books to lend. Rather, it's an anchor for our town. While our library is an oasis for reflection, it's also an, a, a, a dynamic center for lifelong learning with workshops, discussion groups, lectures, homework center, meeting rooms, art gallery, and an evolving agenda of programs suited to all ages. Today, our 10-year anniversary celebrates a library we can all be proud of, one that is vibrant, thriving, and one that preserves the past while it embraces the future. That said, now let's turn to our speaker. Dennis Lahane belongs as much to Boston as the Boston Red Sox do. The only difference is Lahane has the power to hit the long ball and always bats a thousand. He's published 11 best-selling novels that have been translated into more than 30 languages. His first novel, A Drink Before War, earned him the Seamus Award for detective, fi detective Fiction. Then followed Take My Hand, Darkness, Sacred, Gone Baby Gone, Prayers for Rain, Moonlight Mile, Shutter Island, and Mystic River, which won the Anthony Award for Best Novel, the Barry Award for Best Novel, and the Massachusetts Book Award for Fiction. His most recent work, Live by Night, just won the 2013 Edgar Award for Best Novel. But it is his... <laughs> but it is his epic historical novel, The Given Day, our Cohasset Reads Together selection, which brings us here this afternoon. That story harks back to Boston almost 100 years ago, when violent forces swept through the city and gave rise to game-changing events that continue to resonate today. But more on that later from the fellow who wrote the story. He's also written a collection of short stories in the play Coronado. Three of his novels, Mystic River, Gone Baby Gone, and Shutter Island, have been adapted into award-winning films and Live by Night will also be adapted to film with Ben Affleck as both director and star. Before becoming a full-time writer, Dennis Lehane worked as a counselor with developmentally challenged and abused children. He waited tables, parked cars, drove limos, worked in bookstores, and loaded tractor trailers. His one regret is that no one ever gave him a chance to tend bar. <laughs> he grew up in Dorchester, and divides his time between Florida and Boston. He also serves as a trustee of the Boston Public Library, which he credits for kickstarting his life. There will be time for questions following his talk, and then we hope that you will all join us for wine and cheese at the Cohasset Historical Society at 106 South Main Street. Mr. Lehane will remain here, and he will sign books in the lobby here to my left um, for a short while and then he will move down to the Historical Society to join the reception, and he'll sign more books there. Buttonwood Bookstore has made both novels, The Given Day and Live by Night, available for purchase in both places. 
And just one more thing. If you would like to be on our email list to receive notices of author talks next year and or make suggestions about author events, pick up a postcard either from one of the ushers or on the table as you entered and put your email address on it and give it back to the usher or put it in the basket on the table. You can also put it in the basket at the Historical Society. So finally to our speaker, please make sure your cell phones are turned off and please welcome with me Dennis Lohane. Oh, it, that's some serious light in my face right now. Uh, hi, how are you all? Um, thank you for coming out. I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to speak about a few things. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about how I got, came to write The Given Day uh, and the weird process that led to what was supposed to be a 400-page book about the Boston police strike turning into a 700-page behemoth about everything. Uh, and, uh, but first, I, I just want to say, I want to speak, um, the, I also, this is the only serious part of my talk. Um, the, I, I want to speak to the reason I am standing before you today is, um, it, as was mentioned, I am a, a member of the Board of Trustees of the Boston Public Library. Um, this is something that I consider probably the single greatest honor of my life. And the reason is because the only way I'm standing in front of you, living in the nice house I have, driving the nice car I have, living the wonderful life I have, is because of libraries. It is very simple. It is an A plus B equals C proposition. Um, Libraries uh, completely change lives. Libraries say to somebody from the wrong side of the tracks or a working class background that you matter, that um, you have just as much right to pick that book off the shelf as anybody else, um, as the kid whose father drove him up here in the Bentley. Um, my parents uh, were, were working class immigrants. We were not poor, we were working class. There's a distinction there. Um, but uh, we, were, we were not so we could afford books in the home. Books in the home was considered a luxury. You can't just buy a book. So when they heard about this idea of a library, and when nuns, in the only kind thing I can ever remember nuns doing for me, <laughs> or saying about me, told my mother that I really liked to read, my mother took me to a library, and they gave me this card. And then I got to, I got to take that card, and I got to walk in, and I got two books, and they were free. And I got to take them home, and I got to read them, and I got to bring them back, and I got to get two more books for free. Um, I call this an unequivocal good. Tea Party would call it socialism, but <laughs> I call it an unequivocal good. Uh, this is uh, saying to a kid uh, who would not, who really needs to hear it actually, that your city cares about you, your, your, by extension your state cares about you, by extension your country cares about you. It gives you a sense of value, it gives you a sense of community. It changes everything. So when you think about writing your checks, whenever you write your checks to support various entities at the end of the world, or the, I mean at the end of the, end of the year or at the middle of the year, <laughs> Christmas time, the end of the world, is really no point to write a check. Uh, uh, Please consider donating to libraries. We need them now more than ever, believe me. Uh, all right, that's my stump speech for libraries. Let me just move on. Um, the Given Day, uh, which some of you read. I, I say some of you because uh, there are two compliments. I, well, there are two comments I get most about The Given Day, which I kind of like. I like writing books that kind of divide people. I hear two things about The Given Day. I either hear one of the best books I've read in 10 years, one of the books, best books I've ever read, one of the great American novels, et cetera. It's just well done, thank you. Or I get, I started it. <laughs> Is there gonna be a movie? <laughs> um, the Given Day was a book that I wrote as I was, I was getting into it. I realized that what I was writing was not a 20th century or even a 21st century novel. It was a 19th century novel. I was writing a novel that was making absolutely no concessions to a television age, to an age of instant gratification. This was a book that was meant to be read. This is why, actually, I will never sell it to the movies. Um, because to me, it's my most booky book. Um, and, and it's meant to, uh, 
demand a little something of the reader, particularly in the early stages. The first 50 to 60 pages, there's just a lot of it. There's a big table to be set. So the reader has to stay with it. And, and some people will say to me, uh, it's the only thing that will make me snap a little bit. Somebody will say, well, I really had to, you know, it took a lot of, you know, it took some work to get into. And I'm like, so you're afraid of work? Like, what the, you know, when did this become a bad thing that you had to actually dig into a book a little bit? I'm sorry there was no car chase in the first couple of pages, but um, uh, so um, I tried to make up with that actually when I wrote Live by Night. The first line of Live by Night is many years later when he stood, um, uh, many years later as he stood on, with his feet in a, in a tub of cement on a boat in the Gulf of Mexico waiting to be thrown overboard, Joe Coughlin remembered the day he met blah, 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 blah. Somebody came up to me just before the book was published and they said, um, I really like, a bookstore owner said, I really like the uh, uh, Live by Night once it got going. <laughs> I mean, what's left? You know, if a guy in a tub of cement on a boat about to be chucked out, surrounded by 19 gangsters, if that's not a fast enough opening for you. Um, but anyway, so The Given Day, again, started as a sort of attempt to write a book uh, that was very much in a 19th century novel tradition. Um, and I wanted to write uh, very clearly, I wanted to write about the Boston police strike because I'd heard about the Boston police strike as a kid when, um, when Ronald Reagan invoked it to fire the air traffic controllers, saying that he, he, Calvin Coolidge's famous line, uh, nobody has a right to strike against the public safety, ever. Um, so Reagan used that to fire the air traffic controllers. And um, uh, I said to my father, you know, was this, this line, is apparently it's the Boston police strike? When was the Boston police strike? My father, you know, lied, he was, you know, which I'll get to later, but he did that a lot. Uh, <laughs> he, you know, he said, well, you know, it was back in the, you know, in the 1940s, you know, just trailed off, you know. Uh, there wasn't much information out there about it, and over the years I would just kind of, uh, there was a book, but it had been out of print. It was, it was called A City in Terror. It's now back in print, but it had been out of print. So I, I, I just idly investigated it over the years. I'd look into it here and there, nothing big. And then um, when I was writing Shutter Island, I was doing a lot of research about the 1950s. So I was at the Boston Public Library a lot, um, looking into the Harbor Islands and mental institutions at the time, and et cetera. And I came across just in, out of boredom, I think, a couple of times, references to the Boston police strike, and I looked up a couple of things about it. And then I discovered two facts, two things that made me say I got to write this book. And the first was that there was a cavalry charge down Beacon Hill, which blew my mind. I mean, just absolutely blew my mind. And it was a cavalry charge. You know, this, this, I believe it was the 7th Cavalry. I can't remember exactly now anymore, but it was, I believe it was the 7th Cavalry. And, and the, the whole thing, you know, like a John Ford movie. They had the flag, and they had the hats, and they had the, you know, bumping up and the bugle, and they shoom straight down the cobblestone in Beacon Hill. Just blew my mind. And uh, so that image stuck in my head. And then the second thing, which was really crucial for somebody with, with my class rage issues, was um, uh, the Brahmins, who were quite terrified. Uh, we call them the 1% now, but back then it was the Brahmins. And they were quite terrified that the natives were going to overthrow them, that, the, that the, the great unwashed were going to overthrow them during the Boston police strike. The great unwashed happened to be the Irish. Uh, and they were in South Boston for the most part. That's where the, the vast majority of the rioting broke out during the Boston police strike. So the Brahmins had two things going for them. One, they had the Park Plaza Castle, which I don't know if most of you, I assume, know. The Park Plaza Castle was built specifically for the, in case the poor ever revolted so that the rich could run to the Park Plaza Castle and shoot them. That was the plan. Uh, uh, and you know, maybe some boiling oil. I don't know when they got rid of that. but. Uh, so that's why the Park Plaza Castle exists. When you look at it, realize that. Um, so that was number one. And then number two, they said, well, we've get to get to we got to get to the Park Plaza Castle, and then somebody's got to take care of these rabble-rousers. So they came up with a novel idea of how to deal with the Boston police strike riots. They armed the Harvard football team. That's what they did. They brought in the Harvard football team. They said, well, you seem men of fine standing and you know, good parentage, and here's a rifle. And they gave it to them. And they sent them to the Broadway Bridge in South Boston. And they fired on the crowd. And they killed six people. And it, I just said, that's it. I got to write this. I mean, I have such issues with, with coming from the background I come from that when I got a job teaching at Harvard, I didn't tell my dad for weeks. Because I didn't know how he'd take it. He would either be proud or he'd be embarrassed. I didn't know, you know? Uh, so, um, so yeah, so that was it. That was, it was suddenly like, okay, I have two images to start with. So I'm going to write a book about the Boston police strike. My main character will, of course, have to be a policeman, and I'll have to be conflicted, and, and off I go. Easy. Except you really can't start a book with a police strike. 
So I got to give it context. So where did the police strike come out of? There were, um, uh, I believe, I don't have the stats anymore. They've all left my head. But uh, the year of 1919, there were more labor strikes in the United States than there were ever before or ever after in its history. It was the biggest year for labor strife in the United States. So the Boston police strike was the culmination of it. It was the culmination of nine months of turmoil and 10 years that preceded those nine months. So, all right, so now I gotta give it context. What was the context right before the Boston police strike? The, red, the first Red Scare, it was called the Red Summer. And it was when the Attorney General of the United States decided to go after communists and socialists in our ranks. And it was also called the Red Summer in black America for a completely different reason, because there were several race massacres that summer. And blacks called it the Red Summer because their blood ran red in the streets. So there you go. So I said, all right, so I'll go back to the Red Summer. And then I was like, but you can't really start with, you know, blood in the streets and, and the Red Scare. You gotta give that context. So what turned Mitchell Palmer, progressive Democrat Attorney General, into a red baiting uh, kind of fascist lunatic. Um, oh, well, uh, there was the night of the 32 bombs, which happened in April of 1919. And the night of the 32 bombs was 32 bombs were discovered in the um, postal annex of the Baltimore post, uh, post Office being sent to 32 pl people across the country, including the mayor of Seattle, uh, the head of several major corporations, judges who were involved with deportation of anarchists, um, and several members of government. So there was a very scary and organized terrorist threat in the United States at that point, and they weren't playing around. Um, so I said, oh, that's interesting. That, so there's not of the 32 bombs. All right, but what got Mitchell Palmer really pissed off? And then I realized, oh, in March, they tried to assassinate Mitchell Palmer, which was true. What happened was a bomber, uh, anarchists were very good at building bombs. They weren't very good at exploding them. That was their fatal flaw, really, at the end of the day. Um, <laughs> And, and that's something that the government to this day likes to leave out there. Most of the manuals that show you how to make bombs are flawed, and including the anarchist cookbook. And the government knows this, and they like that. Because the theory is, wouldn't it be great if they blew themselves up before they got to us? Say, three weeks ago, if we heard there was an explosion in an apartment in Cambridge, we would have been like, oh, that's too bad. But it would have been a lot better than what happened on Marathon Monday. So that was the, that's the theory behind bombs out there. And it hasn't changed. So anarchists, very good at making bombs, very bad at detonating them. So the, the guy who was going to kill Mitchell Palmer walked up to his front door, and the bomb exploded. It blew off the entire facade of the entire block on that side of the street. It destroyed Mitchell Palmer's home, and the only reason he lived was because he was in the very furthest back room, the kitchen. And he still ended up with half the house on him. So the bomber was vaporized, truly. They found his head 10 blocks away on a roof. Which I just, I love that. Just, boom! Uh, and um, so that happened. Uh, and then the thing I love about history is the person who pulled Mitchell Palmer out of the rubble was his across the street neighbor, who was the Secretary of the Navy, Navy at the time, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Which I just love. I just love that detail for some reason. Uh, so there you go. I'll start with the assassination attempt on, the, on, on Mitchell Palmer. But you can't really start with an assassination attempt on an attorney general. You need context. And then I realized, oh, wait a minute. Forget, forget context. The molasses flood. Wasn't the molasses flood? You guys hear the molasses flood? Molasses flood. Great thing. OK, so the molasses flood, big tank of molasses uh, in the north end, and it exploded in January of 1919. And it sent 60-foot waves of molasses down through the north end. It did millions and millions of dollars of property damage, killed 16 people. It was a serious event, and they immediately assumed it was a terrorist act, immediately. Um, the owner of the company said immediately, we will get the terrorist who did this. The mayor of Boston came out and said, we're going to find the terrorist who did this. And they began to roust all these, um, basically, Italians. And then, uh, and then they realized, oops, no, it was us. It was, it was, it was a mistake. <laughs> it, was, it was bad regulation of the tank. Um, the tank was supposed to be, uh, it was overfilled because they didn't have to worry about that in January because the molasses would stay cold. The only problem was that week in January, the mean, average mean temperature was 56 degrees. So the tank exploded. Um, so all right, so I'll start with the molasses flood. January 1919. I'm only nine months away from the police strike. That's fine. You can't really start a book with a molasses flood. I mean, 
you have to give it a little bit of context. And one of the most fascinating things about the molasses flood happening in the North End was that the nor North End was the ghetto of Boston back then. It was the worst ghetto of Boston. And it had just come through the Spanish flu. It had just come through the great influenza, which killed more people in the North End than anywhere else, because in the North End it was a ghetto and everybody was packed tightly together. And so they got extremely sick and they all died. Not they all died, but a lot of people died. So here you had, following on the heels of that, a molasses flood in an immigrant community where most people didn't speak the language or understand the United States, had they had their own tight-knit culture, and they had to be thinking, the, the sky is falling. They had to, because we just got wiped out by the great influenza. And before that was World War I. Um, and then I thought, all right, wait a second, though. The great influenza, um, where did the great influenza start? Okay, great influenza killed 60 million people worldwide within one year. There's nothing comparable. The Black Death wasn't comparable. Um, 60 million people died within 12 calendar months, and they think the estimate may be actually much higher because the stats coming out of the Far East are shaky. This could be as many as 80 million people. Um, 60 million people died from the flu. Where did the flu start? They called it the Spanish flu. It had nothing to do with Spain. It started in two cities. It started in Quincy, Massachusetts, very first person ever dropped dead, dropped dead in downtown Quincy, and in Chicago on the same day. And for years, historians of the disease could never understand it. They could never figure that out. How could it begin in an East Coast city and a Midwest city on the same day? Why didn't it happen in New York? Why didn't it happen in Philly? It would. It would catch up to them in four days. The reason was because of the 1918 World Series. The 1918 World Series was played between Chicago and Boston. Chicago and Boston played in the third game in the 1918 World Series, the first one to be played in Boston. The first two were played in Chicago. They traveled together on a train, the two teams. Baseball was extremely unpopular at that point because of war propaganda. There was this idea that if you were fit, you fought. So if you didn't fight, you were considered a slacker. So baseball players were considered slackers. They were considered to be not patriotic enough. And so it was the most sparsely attended World Series in the history of the World Series. Thank God, because it would have been exponential if it had been packed. So there's all these people in the stands. There's all this anti-baseball sentiment. There's all this anti-labor sentiment. There's all this mistrust of labor because they'd begun to paint anybody who fought for their rights as a working man as a socialist or a communist or an anarchist or a terrorist. So this is the great moment. Nobody ever accused athletes of being smart when the players and the Cubs and the Red Sox understand that they're getting, they, they realize they're getting shafted on their, on their pay that year. So they decide to strike. And they decide not to come out for the third game of the World Series. And the people in the stands are already mad enough. And then they look over and they see all these injured veterans who've just returned from the front, many of them se severely injured. And they riot. They riot. They go crazy. And they're ready to hang the Boston Red Sox players and the Cubs players until Honey Fitz, yes, that Honey Fitz, uh, comes running out with a bullhorn and chills everybody out. And they sing a few songs. And then the players come out and they play the game. Those, play, those soldiers were the typhoid Mary of the great Spanish flu. They were the ones who were carrying it. That's why the play, people from Chicago got on the train to Chicago. They went to Chicago. They got off the train. They started dropping dead. And three days later, all the cities they passed through, people began to get sick. So that was, so I said, I have to start with the 1918 World Series. Um, but to do that, I need a character to take you in. Who should I take you in with? Babe Ruth. Because I'd heard a story that Babe Ruth had gotten drunk the night before, surprise, uh, on the train from Chicago got in an argument with somebody, took a swing at him, missed him, this argument as to who it was, but that's it. It was whether it was a cover or a Red Sox. And he took a swing and he missed and he, and he hit a wall. And so he couldn't pitch, he was scratched. He was supposed to pitch that day and he couldn't pitch for, for game three. Um, so I said, that's it, because what I really want to do is tell you the story I just told you. I want the reader to understand that the Spanish flu started at the 1918 World Series. There's only one problem. Nobody knew that information for years and years and years. And I couldn't step out of the book and say, by the way, in the middle of the scene, suddenly the author stands up in the bleachers of Fenway and says, pause the action, please. 
Many years later, people would understand that I couldn't do it. So the reason to write that scene, and I'm very happy with that scene, was to do that, and I never got to spread the information. So now I finally got my book. I'm going to start with the 1918 World Series. I'm going to run it straight up to, um, I'm going to start it straight up to uh, the Boston police strike, and I'll be done. 400 pages, I'll be out. Only problem was, as I was about, as I wrote the scene with Babe Ruth on the train from Chicago, they stopped in, they stopped in Ohio. I have no idea why I had them stop in Ohio. They just stopped in Ohio. And then it turned out there was a problem with the train. And then Ruth just started walking towards some trees. I have no idea why he walked towards the trees. But he walked towards these trees. And he parts the trees, and on the other side of the trees are a bunch of black guys playing baseball. And the white guys come out, and they start playing baseball against the black guys. And the black guys are really good. And so the white guys start cheating. And that set up the sort of thematic underpinnings of the entire book. And there was a central character in there named Luther Lawrence, who then walked off and out of the book and into Ohio, and that was it. And then I went to teach one day, and Luther said, so now we gotta go to Tulsa. And I said, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. You have nothing to do with my book anymore. You were a minor character. And he said, no, I wasn't. I'm a major character. In fact, I'm the major character. And I said, no, my major character is a white police officer. And he said, well, we'll co-star, but you got to get me to Tulsa. And I said, that's ridiculous. I don't know anything about Tulsa. The only thing I know about Tulsa, I know two things about Tulsa. I know that uh, S.E. Hinton was from there, the Outsiders, Tulsa. Uh, and, uh, and I know that there was a race riot there in 1921. And as that idea is in my head, and I'm having this argument with my character, I'm in a bookstore. And I'm literally walking, wandering through the bookstore, killing time before I went to teach a class at Harvard. And I'm walking in the bookstore, and I look, and there's this book on a shelf right in front of me. And I go, and I pull it off the shelf, literally, just like it was a magnet. And it's a book called The Burning, about the 1921 race riot in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So that's how a 400-page book that would have probably taken two years became a 700-page book that took five years, um, which is what has led me here before you guys today. Uh, I'm going to now uh, rattle through a very quick uh, version and take some questions. Uh, the other thing that I get most questions about besides how do I write, what's my process? Well, you just heard my process. It's crazy. Don't follow it. Don't try it. If you're a writer, don't do it. Um, uh, the other reasons I'm here before you as a writer, I besides libraries, I've figured, out, um, I've figured out a few. One is that I, I, I don't come from a literary background, as I mentioned, but I do come from a family that had um, no respect for facts. Absolutely none. <laughs> none. Uh, facts were facts. Um, they were, I came from a storytelling culture. And so every Friday and Saturday night, my, uh, my father and my mother and their brothers and sisters and in-laws and, and cousins would all get together at somebody's house in Dorchester, Mattapan, or Somerville, and they would tell stories. That's what they did. Every single Friday and Saturday, they, they made highballs, they drank schlitz, they smoked cigarettes, and they told stories. And you knew they were drunk when my dad and my Uncle Tommy started singing Danny Boy. That was the cue. <laughs> and so, and they would, I mean, my brother noticed very early on that a strange thing happened. Uh, every about six weeks or so, the same story came back into rotation. But it had been tweaked. <laughs> it had been changed. They were, in effect, lying. Uh, <laughs> And so we understood, and not only did nobody call them out and say, you told that story six weeks ago, and it was completely different, but they nodded, like, this is the point. This is why we gather. We gather to make stuff up. <laughs> and so what I would understand many years later, somebody who put it perfectly cogently to me, my mentor, when I was in graduate school, described writing as the lie that tells the truth. And that's when I finally got it. That's what they were doing. They were telling legends about the old country so they could make sense of it so they could make sense of who they were and where they came from. And the, the way to do that was to tell an emotional truth, was to tell a story that was true while not being necessarily factual, if you will. Um, the next reason I did this was because um, Bostonians, maybe because they're from an Irish culture, have a very similar relationship with facts. You know, it's just, let, let me put it in perspective. I am thanked on a regular basis for writing Mystic Pizza. Uh, <laughs> true. Which makes me a prodigy because I was 19 when Mystic Pizza came out. Um, I am thanked 
I get fan mail from famous people for writing The Departed. <laughs> Essentially, if there's, a, if there's a movie set in Boston and there's a bar in it and a gun, I wrote it. <laughs> um, I get this, you have no idea, all the time. Um, I was in a bar once and, uh, and it was a little tiny bar. It's uh, called Old Sully's. It's in South Boston. Anybody see the movie The Town? Ben Affleck movie? Okay. Uh, that's the bar they drink at. Is, is, that's Old Sully's. It used to be a speakeasy. When you read the first chapter, or if you read, or you should damn well read, the first <laughs> chapter of Live By Night, he follows a woman at the very end to a speakeasy. That speakeasy is Old Sully's. I just don't name it. But it's Old Sully's. And the Union Street in Charlestown. So I go in there one time for a drink, and, and Old Sully's is about the size of here, right to the end of my arms. Uh, three stools, a little bar, that's it. So I'm sitting in there, there's two guys to my right, the bartender says, uh, you look like the guy who wrote uh, Mystic River. Every now and then, you know, why not? I'm like, I am the guy who wrote Mystic River. Oh my God, this is the guy who wrote Mystic River and Shutter Island and God may be gone. And the guy to my right turns and he says, hi, I'm Tim. Which is the only thing he'll say for the rest of the time he's in that bar. And he'll say it every five minutes. <laughs> and And the guy past him stands up, and he comes walking over to me, and he says, he's wasted, and he says, so you wrote The Departed? <laughs> I say, no, I didn't. And, and he looks at me like he knew that. He says, Jack Nicholson a prick? <laughs> I say, I have no idea, I didn't write The Departed. I had nothing to do with The Departed. Bartender starts shouting him down. He didn't write the departed. He wrote Gone Baby Gone, Mystic River, Shadow Island, Sit Down. The guy goes, sits down. The guy beside me goes, Hi, I'm Tim. A <laughs> uh, couple minutes later, the other guy again stands up, comes wavering on over to me, says, So is Matt Damon shot? I, said, I have no idea. I didn't write the departed. I don't know Mr. Damon. You know, uh, Go home, I tell my wife that story, and, uh, and, and she says, honey, that's insane. Tr truly, it's insane. People can't think you wrote The Departed. I said, babe, everybody thinks I wrote The Departed. <laughs> and uh, I sometimes think, you know, poor Bill Monaghan, not poor Bill Monaghan, rich Bill Monaghan, but Bill Monaghan, who actually wrote The Departed, who's from Dorchester and has an Academy Award for the film. Sometimes I, I picture him in his, like, home in the Hollywood Hills, pointing at the Oscar, going, I wrote that! <laughs> um, so... Uh, so my wife says that to me. I said, yeah, I know, honey. It's insane, but it's true. And she she's, she's shakes that off. She goes out. She's walking her dog, uh, and she's in this park across from our house in Charlestown, and, and, and she runs into this woman, and the woman says, um, the woman says, oh, hi. You know, they get, they get to talking about their dogs, and then she says, look, we, we know who you are. It's Charlestown. It's very small. You know, she says, we, we all know who you are. Don't worry. We won't tell anybody. We, you know, and, which is true, because uh, this is why I love Charlestown. I was really bummed when I'm out of move, but... Uh, and when I lived in Charlestown, I lived right beside the only barber shop in Charlestown. There's only one, and I lived right beside it. So people, particularly when there was big press stories and they, they, they wanted a Boston slant, the press would come to the, to the barber shop in Charlestown, and they would say, which house does he live in? Because they knew I lived either to the right of it or to the left of it. And the guys who ran the barber shop, it's just Charlestown, man, code of silence, you know? They'd be like, oh, no, 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 he's not, not this barber shop. He's at the one in the projects. And they would send, there's no barber shop in the projects. And they would send these guys into the Bunker Hill projects. Anybody who ever asked me, I don't know how many muggings or beatdowns happened because people asked where I lived. But I feel really, uh, it made me just feel warm inside. Um, <laughs> So the woman says to my wife, and she can believe it, she says, don't worry, we won't say anything with Charlestown, we'll go to silence, we don't say anything. It's, my wife says, fine. She goes, just tell them how much we love the town. So now everybody thinks I, read the t or I wrote the town. Um, so uh, the other reasons that I became a, a writer uh, were, um, I, 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 quite frankly, I just, I suck at everything. I have no other gifts whatsoever. I tell stories, that's it. There's no other demonstrable skills that I have. Um, I'm good at pool, but I think you can really make a living at that. I mean, some people do, but not for me. Um, I, uh, I loved to read. I loved to read my entire life. I love narrative. I love anything that's a story. I love to sit and hear really good stories. Nothing makes me angrier than hearing a bad story. Truly nothing makes me angrier. My wife can't understand why certain people incense me, and it's because they're the type of people who take nine hours to tell a four-minute anecdote 
Those people drive me insane. I take it as a professional in insult. If I'm sitting in a room with somebody who says, and they always think they're good at it, they take a long breath, they pour a tall glass of wine, so you all know you're in for it, and then they say, I remember back when I worked with Jimmy. Do you remember Jimmy? Jimmy, well, Jimmy had that sister, Rose. Rose, da she dated that guy, and, and, and 45 minutes later, she's still not back to why she started that story. I, those people, I once got up in the middle of one of those conversations, and I went and I used the bathroom. My buddy almost got divorced over it. He said, dude, you walked out on my wife. I said my teeth were floating. It was an hour and a half story. It was four minutes of facts. Um, or, or detail. Um, so yes, so I love narrative. I am obsessed with narrative. I love great storytelling. I can sit and listen to a great storyteller for 10 hours, no problem whatsoever. Um, uh, another reason I got into writing, which is the reason most uh, guys, to be honest, get into writing. I got into writing for women. Uh, we, it's true, chicks, man. I mean, it, it perfectly respectable, intelligent women who would never even look at you will will actually date you if you're an artist you know my friends would be like you're just a, a drunken bum like the rest of us and i'd be like oh no i'm sensitive i i feel um she's paying your rent no it's an investment in the future uh i um I, uh, it shouldn't be a surprise to those of you who read Live By Night. Uh, another reason that I'm, I'm, I'm here is because my first real exposure to an art form was, uh, besides uh, Warner Brothers cartoons, um, you know, Bugs Bunny and stuff like that, was um, uh, Sesame Street, of course. Um, more communist, uh, publicly funded lunacy, apparently. Uh, uh, the other reason was uh, um, when I was a kid, my uncle, one of my uncles who would go over to his house, when we went to his house on Saturdays, every, you know, once a month, they would have the Jimmy Cagney double feature and he would always watch it. And I would sit and I would watch with my uncle Jimmy Cagney movies. And so when I was a little kid, when I was like seven, eight. So uh, Jimmy Cagney movies became like my first, that's my bedrock. Oh, and the Bible. The Bible. Jimmy Cagney movies and the Bible. Those two together. Um, so uh, I was always wanting to write a gangster book. I've always wanted to do a gangster film. Um, so that's why, I that's what Live By Night is. That's my, my 40 years in the making dream. Uh, to write a gangster book, so. Um, and then finally, I would say the, uh, the final other reason I became a writer, I think, is because um, I was trying to make sense. I grew up, they say, it's a curse or a blessing, depending. Uh, may, you grow, may you live in interesting times. I grew up in one of the more uh, watershed moments in, this, in the history of the city of Boston. I grew up on the front lines uh, during the federal desegregation of Boston Public Schools, during busing. So um, I, uh, I, I had a very, um, dramatic and fr uh, front row seat to um, what, I un what I would now un classify as this. The very first intelligent thought I believe I ever had, and I don't know when I had it, but it was the very first one I had, was that um, race warfare is class warfare. That, it's, that is, there is no such thing at the end of the day as race warfare, it's class warfare. It is in the best interest of the ruling class to keep the working class fighting amongst itself. I believe that then, I believe it now, I believe it to the end of time. Um, so that, is, uh, that was the final thing, I think, was the final incitement, was to be blessed enough to grow up in an interesting time in what I consider one of the most interesting cities in, this, in the world, and certainly in this country, because I've traveled this country, and we rock. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I saw some stupid comment after the Patriot bomb, and they don't pull this in Mississippi. Why would they bother? <laughs> you don't get the same effect when you blow up a corn dog stand. Uh, so um, that'll go viral tonight. Um, I don't care. Uh, so uh, let's take some questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Sting? So, yes, and they'll be moving with uh, microphones down the aisle. So We have some microphones here, so if you're going to ask a question, raise your hand and we'll try and get to you. Okay. 
Uh, I'll take the gentleman up. Gentlemen, you can speak to me first. Yep. Uh, what other authors do you really like to read when you want some downtime? What other authors do I like to read when I want downtime? Um, what's downtime? <laughs> uh, I got two kids under four. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's funny. Um, <laughs> hmm. I haven't read for pleasure. I'm trying to remember the last book I read for pleasure. Um, yeah, I'm in trouble here. Uh, I think it was a wonderful book called Serena by Ron Rash. Um, it's sort of a modern retelling of Macbeth, uh, set in um, uh, the Pacific Northwest at the turn of the last century. Uh, that was a wonderful book. Um, mostly, m very, very, very primarily, I read nonfiction. I don't read much fiction anymore. There's a couple of reasons for it. One is because I just don't have the time. Um, it, 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 until my kids are out of the labor intensive years, and right now I got a four year old and a one year old, um, I just don't have the time to concentrate. It's like you, I can barely get through an episode of The Walking Dead. You know, without mommy, dad, you know, okay. Uh, so that, uh, that's one reason. Two, I think it just becomes a casualty of what we do for a living. Um, I, I don't, you know, my best buddy's a carpenter. He doesn't, the last thing he does is come home, much to his wife's chagrin, and want to work on his own house. And uh, I think at the end of the day, when I want to check my head out, I want to read nonfiction. Because when I read fiction, I'm constantly thinking about what would I do? Well, how can I use this? How can this, you know, is he doing something better than me? You know, et cetera, et cetera. So, What's yeah. Uh, my favorite nonfiction, uh, my favorite piece of nonfiction. No, it's going to make me sound like such a homer, but it's true. My favorite piece of nonfiction is probably The uh, Common Ground by Anthony Lucas about busing. Uh, but um, I, love, um, I love Malcolm Gladwell. I love reading the articles that are in Hopper's and The New Yorker. I love reading uh, histories. I'm reading uh, the book right now by Phil Brick about uh, Battle of Bunker Hill. Um, and, uh, and then I'm reading like Billy Friedkin's biography. and. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what else I got. It's just stacked up on my bed stand. I, I just dip in and I dip out and I dip in and I dip out. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean that's that's it. But I would say right now it's becoming this weird. Um, it's the last thing I do. I probably read less than I've ever read in my life. Um, the only good thing about that is the only good thing about getting a master's degree is that you at least feel you've shored up a lot. You got way ahead of everybody else, you know? I mean, I read through most great writers. I've read through all the great dead white men. And, and so I'm, I'm covered. You know, I can, I can still quote Shakespeare. I can quote Fitzgerald. I can quote some Hemingway. So I'm covered for the literary cocktail party. Um, and I can, and you, you gotta make at least one quote kind of obscure. Like you can't go walking around, to, you know, to be or not to be, that is the question, whether it's just noble or just swing, slings. You gotta be able to like whip out, um, you know, who like the base Indian threw away a pearl worth more than all his tribe. That's, that's a good one. Anybody? Anybody? No? Othello. That was Othello. Okay. Yes, miss. Oh, sorry, okay, I'm sorry, the microphone has been handed out. I'm sorry, my bad. So yes, the, was the microphone handed out? Okay. Right here. Okay, so whoever has the microphone, <laughs> I have please. the mic. Ooh. Okay. No. Um, just wanting to know how you arrived at the title, The Given Day. Oh. The, your kind of process about that. Oh, the title of The Given Day, that's actually, it's my wife's favorite story, um, because she's part of it. So, uh, I had a story called, uh, I had the, the, the working title of the novel and the title of the novel in most countries uh, actually is A Country Before Dawn. Um, and I just one day woke up and I said, I hate that title. It's pretentious, it's, it's overblown. Uh, a Country Before Dawn should be all in caps. So I, I, I said, I'm, I'm dumping that title. I don't want that title. And, uh, and then I was, I was taking a walk. I was in uh, literally, I was in the south of France with my wife at a, at a literary festival. And uh, she was my girlfriend at the time, uh, just before we got married. And uh, I was walking through a park with her, and I thought, oh my God, I'm in the south of France. This is insanity. I, I'm in the south of France, and I'm with like the nicest, most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And, and I said, wow, life really is a gift. And that was it, a given day. Every day is a gift. And that was something that was fitting the book because the last line of the book is what a time to be alive. 
what I was when I was writing the book, what I what I kept coming across over and over and over again is yes, you had to feel the sky was falling every second in those 12 months, but what a time to be alive. And so I think it's just a, it's the book is a really uh, a celebration. I think of all my books, it's the most optimistic book I've ever written, and I think it's the biggest celebration of sort of the this idea of human community. Um, so that's why I thought of the given day. Did that help? All right. Uh, next for person with microphone. I I, I don't. Yes. I think I've enjoyed all of your books. I haven't read the latest one, but I'll probably get that today. But my question is, did you ever find your dog? Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you. No, we, did, we never found our dog, the most famous dog in America. Um, we never found her. Uh, that was an odd situation. I never understood the power of the media truly until that moment. What happened was when my dog went missing, I, I just came up with this idea. I just said, oh, what the hell? You know, it's just a throwing a, a spitball at the wall to see if it stuck. I, I put it up on my Facebook page that anybody who found the dog, in addition to getting some cash reward, would get name, uh, their name put in a book. And it was a really slow week for the media, apparently, because within hours, I was getting blown out with an interview, interview request. Within 24 hours, it was CNN, the Today Show, Good, Mor Good Morning America, all local media. I had every single net local channel. Uh, it was insane. And people say all this over a dog. And I try to explain it wasn't over the The media didn't care about the dog. The media cared about the hook. And the hook was, nobody's ever done this before. Nobody ever said, would you like to have a character named after a book and you find my dog? Uh, it still didn't find my dog. So there goes, to, there goes a real good uh, point about the power of the press after a certain point. So, but thank you for asking. Uh, yes, somebody is holding the mic, yes? I, hello? Yeah, yeah so um, kind of a two-parter, but which part of you most identifies with Patrick Kenzie? And okay. will we see Patrick and Angie again? Uh, the part of me, okay, uh, let me answer the first half first. I mean, the second half first. Uh, Patrick and Angie, um, Patrick is in a short story that I'm not sure where it's going to come out. It, it's probably going to be online, uh, Amazon, possibly. I don't know. I don't know the details yet. But I did a story for an anthology where we decided to have famous detectives cross paths. So me and Michael Conley wrote a story together. So Harry Bosch and, and Patrick Kenzie solve a crime together. So that's uh, going to be, we don't know wh where that's going to show up. But I would say if you're at all virally savvy, keep looking for it. It's going to come soon. It's coming from the International Thriller Writers Association. Uh, so there's that. Um, there's also a TV show that's been in the works for quite some time um, about Patrick and Angie. I don't know if that's going to happen, but I do know that I've seen the latest draft of the script. So uh, will there be another book? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I, 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 I can only, the only part of my process that's really arty farty is I can only write when characters speak to me. I cannot chase them down and make them talk to me. And, and I, so that's why I don't produce a book a year. That's why I ended a series five books in. It, it's, it's impossible for me to produce good work that way. It's one thing I've learned about myself where if I get up every morning and I say, oh my God, I can't wait to tell this story, whatever that story may be, it'll be a good book. It might not be the book you want, but it'll be a good book. So that's where I stand on Patrick and Angie. If they come knocking at the door again, I'd love to write about them. Trust me, my publisher would love to write me, me to write about them. Um, but I can only do what the characters what inspire me to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, and there was a woman who's been waiting patiently. Yes. Now your mic doesn't work. This is irony. OK. Oh, okay, so what was it like the first time I knew that they wanted to make a movie or the first time they were going to? It's a big distinction. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, well, because they, they, you know, my first, I sold a drink before the war within two months to, to a, a production company associated with an actor. Um, and then that went nowhere. And then I sold, I, uh, I had talks with various people over the years about the Patrick and Angie series, and they all went nowhere. Um, and then... Uh, and then Gone Baby Gone, well, no, Prayers for Rain was optioned for a while, and then that lapsed but was immediately swung into Gone Baby Gone, and then that's when Ben Affleck came out of the woodwork and was doing Gone Baby Gone, but then that project was going on forever. That was a long time between that project going on and actually being made. So then with Mystic River, when Clint Eastwood 
finally convinced me to sell it to him, and it took a little bit of time because I didn't want to sell it. Uh, when he convinced me to sell it to him, um, I knew that Clint Eastwood does not develop. What that means is when Clint Eastwood buys a book, he makes it into a movie every time. Studios develop, which means they buy books, they try to make them into movies. Most times it doesn't happen. They go on by the, by the next book, by the next book, by the next book, somebody else's book. Um, Eastwood buys a book, and a year later, it's a movie. That's how he works. So I knew the moment I said yes to him, it was going to be real. And I said yes. And then, uh, here, I'll tell you a great story. This is everybody loves the story. <laughs> uh, it'll explain more about my background than, than 50 books. Um, when I sold the rights to Clint Eastwood, I called my parents. My parents did something that if I can stop you from doing this to your children someday, I will have performed a very important public service. <laughs> my parents did what all parents do, what many parents do, particularly parents from the Northeast. They retired and they bought a house in Florida. They got a house in Florida and then they decided to get two phones. And the principle behind the two phones was so when their kids called on Sunday, they could e each pick up a phone. And this would help facilitate communication. <laughs> it does not. What happens is the kid calls up, the first person answers the phone, start to get into conversation. Oh, hi, Mom. How are you? He's good. The second phone is picked up. Hello? Who's that? It's Dennis. It's Dennis. Oh, who's on the phone? It's Dennis, Mike. Dennis is on the phone? Where, how are you? He's good. Where are you, Ann? I'm in the other room. I'm in the living room. <laughs> Where are you? I'm in the back bedroom. Oh, OK. I don't like the reception in the back bedroom as much as the one in the living room. So who's calling? Gerard's on the phone? No, Dennis is on the phone. This is a conversation. This is what happens. So I call my parents, and I sell the rights to Clint Eastwood, and I call my parents, and my parents each pick up a phone, and I say to my parents, uh, I just sold the rights to Mystic River, the movie rights to Mystic River, to Clint Eastwood. And my mother says, oh my, in a tone of voice that makes me realize my mother is attracted to Clint Eastwood, <laughs> which... <laughs> which I had never wanted to know. And, <laughs> but my father, God bless him, comes in and saves the day by saying, who's Clint Eastwood? <laughs> and then they lose me. My mother says, Mike, you know who Clint Eastwood is? And he says, I have no idea. And she says, he was in Westerns. And my father says, was he on Bonanza? And she says, I don't think so. And then my father says, then I have no idea who he is. So there you go. That's what it was like to sell my film to Clint Eastwood. Uh, no, it was great. And it was a really great experience. Um, and it's been a great experience now three times out. It's been, I've been three very good films made for my books. All you hope for is um, that they will, they, will make, they will capture the spirit of the book. That's what you want. You know, they can't capture the letter. They capture, capture the letter of a book and take, ten, make 10-hour movies. So you just play, pray they capture the spirit of the book, and they have every single time. And I've just been really blessed. And I only work with a very select few people in Hollywood. I will not, my list of people I will even take a phone call from is really small. And, uh, and then I just hope from the best from there because after that I don't control it and I don't want to. The moment I sell it to you, I step back. And I just say, you do your thing and you need to call me, here's my number. You don't need to call me, don't call me. I won't be insulted. You know, and I let the artist do the thing that he needs to do because I wouldn't want me looking over my shoulder. And if I ever get to the point where I option somebody's book, I'm going to you know, buy, the little, buy the writer a drink and then ignore him uh, because he's the novelist. He's not, you know, a novelist on a film set is far less important than a caterer, you know? <laughs> and all a novelist can do is stand around and be like, uh, I really like Gin Shutter Island. You know, I, what are you going to say? So, um, so yeah, I just like to let, I, I like to get involved with very good people and then let them work. So I can't see. Um, who has the microphone what, next? Okay. What was it like working, actually working with uh, Clint Eastwood? Uh, what was it like working with Clint Eastwood? Um, it was a joy. It was an absolute joy. He was, um, he kept me involved in every step of the process. Uh, he was, um, I, you know, I can't say a bad word about the guy. He was, he was the, uh, still to this day, he's the gold standard for anybody I've ever dealt with in Hollywood. Um, everybody so far pales by comparison. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, uh, we almost got involved in a project together a couple of years ago, and, uh, and we spent a few days on the phone talking about it, and it was just so fun the way it was just like, wow, you're dealing with something. There's just no... Hollywood is filled with people who like to hear themselves talk. That's the bottom line. You take meetings all the time. 
and then you realize there was no point to take this meeting except they just wanted to justify their expense account. That was it. And uh, Clint Eastwood is not that way. He wants to sit, he wants to have a conversation, he wants there to be a point, and he wants to get something made from it. And that's it. And maybe it's because he's Scottish and I'm Irish, but I get it. And it's, I do not want to have conversations with people that aren't going to go someplace. Um, so um, that's, you know, that's what my four-year-old daughter's for. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so I just, um, I, I, I love the guy, I love the experience. But I've been treated really well in general. I've had a ridiculously good run with Hollywood, really good. I don't have too many bad Hollywood stories. I've got a few, but I don't have too many. Most of mine are really good. So, uh, there's a woman down front who said her hand up forever. I feel, I feel terrible. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, Was Deer Island the basis for Shutter Island? No, uh, Moon Island. Uh, Moon Island was, and then it was Moon Island on crack. It was, it, Moon Island was a minimum security mental institution that I, I went out to when I was a little boy. And it was take that, turn it to a maximum security uh, mental institution for only the most deranged and dangerous and move it out. Like I moved it out. I called the Boston Harbor Island Authority. I said, what is the furthest, uh, what is the furthest island nautically speaking from Boston? And then they said it was, I can't remember which one it was, but it's 12 miles. So Shutter Island's 13 and just pushed it out as far as I could. So I'm sorry, and sir in the back, you had the question? Um, as a fellow BC High grad, congratulations on your success. And oh, thank you, thank you very much. But also, uh, how much of an effect did uh, uh, George Higgins have on your uh, writing? Uh, another George, South Shore, uh, writing George Higgins, um, okay, George Higgins wrote what I consider the, still consider the great Boston novel, which is The Friends of Eddie Corps. Um, uh, he had almost zero effect on me because I only read Friends, Friends of Eddie Coyle. I never read anything else by him. However, George V. Higgins had a huge influence on Elmore Leonard. He, Elmore Leonard credits George V. Higgins as changing his style as a writer. And Elmore Leonard would be in my top five most influential writers on me. So George V. Higgins did, but not in the way you think. It's like people say, well, how, how were you affected by Chandler? I wasn't. I, never, I read Chandler when I was 10. And I read right through him, because he didn't write much. He wrote five books. I read through the books. I was done. Never read them again. And people say, well, you were clearly influenced by him. I wasn't clearly influenced by him, but I must have been influenced by people who were influenced by him. So I read a lot of people who loved Chandler. Um, biggest influence, certainly on my detective fiction, is a book called The Last Good Kiss, which is written by uh, James Crumley, which is an homage to The Long Goodbye, which is written by Raymond Chandler. You, know, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's like there is an influence. There is a chain of influence but it's not as direct as it seems. So for me and Higgins, it really came through Elmore Leonard. For me and Chandler, it came through James Crumley and Robert Parker. So, and I'm blind as a bat. Um, and yeah, yes, there's a woman right here who's had her hand up for quite some time. Sorry. I was actually gonna ask you about your book. I just wanna say how many drafts How many drafts did it take me to write Mystic River? Um, this extremely wise woman said that one of her favorite books is Mystic River. Uh, <laughs> raised very well, apparently. Uh, yes, uh, Mystic River took a lot of drafts. I'm trying to think. That was one of the real hard ones. Um, I know that I was, I know that at one point I wrote 100 pages in the wrong direction and lost six months on the book. I know that. I remember that very vividly because I put my hand through a computer. Uh, and, uh, and that was a fun day, trying to take that to the store and say, I had this big elaborate story about a baseball and <laughs> They were like, wow, it looks just like a fist. Uh, <laughs> um, so Mystic River had a lot of fits and starts. It had a lot of, uh, uh, there was just a lot. Of, uh, it was a very painful book to write. It was, it, was, um, it, it was alternately painful, I would say. I would say it was painful and excruciating most days, and yet at the same time, I was very aware, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph, that I was writing above my weight class. I knew that uh, this was, this was going to be the, ch the game changer at an aesthetic and critical level. I never expected that book to be a hit. I never for one second thought that book was going to be a success financially. Um, because, you know, I remember, well, you know, my first wife read it and she said, you know, this is the best thing you've ever written, but my God, what are you going to call it? Everybody loses? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Mystic River is a book in which everybody loses, there's no closure. Um, and, and, and pretty much the bad guy gets away. And that's the book that's your hit. 
you know, people say, didn't you know it was going to be a smash? Yeah, that's it. Because the, America loves books where the bad guy gets away, there's no closure, and everybody loses. Uh, but it struck a chord. I don't know what happened. I really don't know what happened. But, uh, so yeah, I, I, was, um, I knew when I finished that, it's one of those few times where you sit and you look at a book and you say, I nailed this. I, it, I don't think it's going to make any money. But I know that I will always know I wrote this book. And, and that felt really good. So, thank you. Um, okay, uh, this gentleman, yes. How'd you get so good with the mafia in the background on the mafia, the sort of the flavor and the feel of the mafia? Um, I watched a lot of movies, I think. <laughs> uh, I don't know, you know, I, uh, people say, how do you do cops so well? Did you know cops growing up? I didn't. Uh, a cop said to me something once I've never forgotten, though. He said, uh, the one thing you guys always get wrong, we never take it personal. We just punch in a clock, you know? And I, and I took that to heart when I created my cops in most of my books. It's a job. They're, they're municipal uh, employees. That's what they do. And they just happen to have guns. Uh, the mob, the same thing. I look at it as um, Hitler, this is the way I look at it. Hit, this is my approach to character. Hitler didn't get up every morning, look himself in the mirror and say, <laughs> I'm going to do evil. People don't work that way. People don't think that way. Hitler probably got up every morning and thought uh, some deranged BS about how he was going to help the Reich and how he was going to help the German people regain, regain their pride or whatever BS he was into. Um, so uh, people usually, bad people usually think they're good. Is, is my point. Um, and uh, Stalin, I think, knew it. I think Stalin just got up every day and <laughs> said, I'm a really sick, evil monster, and I want to do m more bad stuff. Uh, but um, but uh, v the vast majority of people, I think, just get up and they, and they say, uh, I am going to do what I need to do to put food on my table. And if that means that occasionally I have to kill somebody and nobody's looking, and I grew up in a culture that, that applauds it, then, then I will do that. I will say one thing, I, and this is very clear in Live By Night. It's not condoning it by any means. I still think you lose your soul no matter what. But I find zero difference, zero difference, between somebody who works for the mafia and causes all sorts of damage in people's lives and somebody who knowingly shorted stock or somebody who kicks people out of their homes on bad loans that they knowingly sold. They are scumbag sociopaths, and so are the mafia. And I don't see a difference. I see no moral difference whatsoever, and you can't convince me otherwise. And, and yet we let, we, let one group, we let one group show up at cocktail parties, and that blows my mind. You know, um, I knew a guy, and this goes into a lot of writing I do, I knew a guy once, his job is to help companies hide the fact that they are selling what are no, what's known as um, what was the word? Uh, uh, I, I won't. I don't have the term exactly, but it's compromised land. Let us just say. And what this guy does is he helps people sell cancer to children, essentially. He helps them repackage land that they know is filled with carcinogens. And, and they build schools on it, and they do all sorts of things. And he makes a living at it. And uh, he's very happy. He's a very happy guy. And he was telling me what he did at a cocktail party once, literally at a cocktail party at my house in Florida. And I remember just going, I would rather hang with a drug dealer. I truly would. I would rather be with a drug dealer right now. And yet everybody in this party, if they knew a guy was a drug dealer or a pimp, would be like, oh, no, we can't talk to him. But this guy has stepped into a place where in, in American society, if you're making money doing something that's legal, no matter how, how immoral, no matter how abhorrent, we say, it's okay. You know, literally, last week in Louisville, all that news about the, the people who sell guns to children. And we go, well, they're just making a living. It's the American way. I, it baffles, it boggles my mind. It absolutely boggles my mind. I would ra much rather be hanging around with a Coke dealer. I truly would. He, at least, you know, he's, as long as he's selling to adults, I'm fine with him. He's a good guy. I <laughs> wished I still did it. <laughs> but I'm much older now and much more sensible and conservative. Dennis, do you uh, write more than one book at a time, or do you focus singularly on one? And secondly, okay. what are you currently working on? All right, I, um, that's a good question. 
Um, I never write more than one book at a time. That's insane um, for me. For me, I know other writers who do it. I just ugh, couldn't do it. Um, books are to me, um, they're, very, they're very difficult to do. Uh, I love them very much, um, but they're, they're very hard. And they're very intimate. Uh, my relationship when I'm writing a book is my relationship to a reader. It, it's, it's very metaphysical. It's all sorts of weird stuff going on there. I'm writing to somebody who's sitting in a room. For some reason, I was picture a Victorian. And I'm speaking to them through a book. I'm speaking to them over miles, in some cases, oceans. And uh, it, it, something strange happens when you do that. And I have, to, I have to do everything. I'm God. I have to set the table. I have to make the house look perfect. I have to paint all the walls. I have to install the subflooring and the plumbing and everything. So I can only do that one, one house at a time. <laughs> uh, screenplays are a totally different animal to me. Um, screenplays are, there's an old line, uh, a, a novelist is God and a screenwriter is God's tailor. And for some reason, God's tailor gets paid more than God, but we, we don't know why that is. But anyway, um, so when you're a screenwriter, you're writing for 100 people. You don't have to, I mean, you literally write for 150 people. That's usually what's the a film crew is 150. Uh, you're writing for the set designers, you're writing for the set decorators, you're writing for the actors, you're writing for the directors. You're just a cog in the wheel. And it's great. You don't have to do anything. You write. It, the hardest thing for me as a writer, hands down, is to describe rooms. I don't know why. I just have a very hard time with that. I have a hard time. The, if you get to live by night, um, you'll, you'll see there's a scene set during the opening of what is now the Park Plaza Hotel which was then the Hotel Statler, and it opened in 1926. And I have a whole big scene the night it opened, and it's factually correct. And, and, the, and it's a, Joe walks into this massive gala filled with every luminary in the city and this, you know, all this pomp and circumstance going on. That scene was harder for me to write than anything else in the book, anything else. And if I was writing that as a screenwriter, it would just say, interior, Hotel Statler, night. So, um, and you know, I'd write like, you know, lots of rich people standing around in top hats, blah, blah, blah. And then Joe moves through room. Um, so screenwriting is much easier for me and much less taxing on me mentally and takes so much less out of me. Um, it's also less pre pleasurable in some odd way in the way that I believe, kind of what I said in this article I wrote last week about Bostonians, and I believe this to my core about New Englanders, the best stuff is the hard stuff. The best stuff is the stuff that comes a little harder, you know? So I get my greatest pleasure out of my books. I just do. Um, so what am I working on right now? I'm finishing up a book set in 1943, which is um, going to continue. Uh, one of the characters from Live By Night is in this book. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to follow uh, each decade of the 20th century through this bloodline, through a couple of different bloodlines. I want to um, I wanna follow a couple of families. So I'm doing that. Uh, I am uh, working on a TV show called Boardwalk Empire as a writer-producer. Uh, I am, uh, I just had a film uh, finish shooting from an original screenplay I wrote in uh, Brooklyn. I was working on that all the time. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I'm in talks to uh, uh, write um, a pretty high-profile screenplay. I'll, I'll know that tomorrow and um, I, I sold a TV show that I can't discuss beyond that. I sold a TV show to a network who will be named later. Um, and uh, I think that's it. <laughs> yes, that's it. Uh, but that's, that's what's going on. It's chaos right now. It's total wonderful chaos, and I'm very happy. And I keep saying, we keep saying it's crazy, it's horrific, but you don't, I mean, it's not horrific, but it's crazy, and it's, I never sleep, and I barely see my friends, and, and but I, um, I, I am one, I'm, an, I'm in the entertainment business. That means I fear when the phone stops ringing, not when the phone's ringing too much. So. Yes. Uh, excuse me. Going back to what you first said about libraries. Yes. Growing up in Dorchester on Crescent Avenue and getting a library card from Upland's Corner was probably one of the best gifts ever, so I could completely identify with Oh, you grew up on Crescent Avenue. You grew I up did. three blocks from me. <laughs> wow. I did. Yeah. Yes. But uh, I could really identify with what you mentioned yeah. about it being a wonderful, life-changing gift. Thank it you. Was. Oh, thank you. I, the thing we have to remember, I think, is that we're, we've entered this really kind of bottom-line, zero-sum age. 
And, you know, when uh, there was just an article today, I read about it, you know, Rick Perry's going after uh, University of Texas. He's trying to cut all the classes that teach stupid things like literature and art. So who needs to talk about Shakespeare? I mean, really. Um, I, I'm not sure Rick Perry can pronounce Shakespeare, but at least, you know, who needs to talk about it? So there is very clearly, I think, in, in, and unfortunately, we do see a, a clear dividing line, too, but there's very clearly a strong anti-intellectual movement going on in this country. And it's got a firmer foothold than I've ever seen before because of the internet, I think. And suddenly all opinions are empirical. All opinions are, are, are you know, I feel like saying to people, people say, I have a right to my opinion. Yeah, you have a right to it, but it's not as good as mine. <laughs> because I went to better schools. I'm sorry, excuse me, you are, you are an idiot. And if that makes me an elitist, then I'm an elitist. You're going to tar me with the brush anyway. Um, I went to a very good school. So if I, if I speak to some, if I see somebody up on a stage and they have a PhD from MIT and they're talking about the creation of the world, they really matter. And the, the, the lunkhead sitting over here who wants to believe that Adam and Eve ran around with dinosaurs is an idiot. And that is a fact. That is not an opinion. Um, so we have entered an age now where, where, where the, I think the Philistines are attacking the gate and they're after knowledge. And what happened at the Boston Marathon was nothing, they, the same, they cut from the same cloth. These are people who hate knowledge. They don't want you to have knowledge. They don't want you to have access to knowledge. They don't w want women to have rights. That's, you know, that's this idiot who rolled the bomb into the, into the bomb, you know, because why? Because he's a little wimp who didn't get his dream fulfilled. And so he blamed America, you know? I really don't want to say nine four-letter words right now. Uh, so it's anti-intellectualism to me seems to be a major enemy right now. And we're entering into a darker and darker age with it. And libraries are the one pinpoint of light guaranteed every time that are shoring up and fighting against that darkness. And I just say, we have to do everything in our power to preserve them. And we have to do everything in our power to preserve people who get up every morning and all they want out of their day is to hand the right book to the right kid. I mean, that's, that's you know. So, you know, yeah, I, I just, I will always be, you know, I, I can still see for the rest of my life, six years old, I can still remember, and I'm 47 now, I can still see my first library card. I can tell you what it looked like, I can tell you what color it was, you know, everything. You know, so. We um, have time um, for about two more questions, and then um, Dennis will be over there in the lobby. You can go over there and talk to him. He will also be down at the Historical Society for a little while. So you can go down there and talk to him. He has lots of answers for your questions. <laughs> uh, so let's in the just back. do two more there's for now. gentleman all the way in the back there, if you want to give him a mic. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, because I'm getting into that season, what is it like to work with Steve Buscemi? Oh, oh, uh, well, I don't work with Steve. I'm sorry. I, he's an actor. Um, so we're in the writer's room. And um, I am now a passive producer because I needed to be back and be with my family. They weren't real keen about the two months I was living in Brooklyn. Um, so uh, I, I'm now a passive producer. I, I do everything through the internet and I fly into Brooklyn every couple of weeks and I hang out in the writer's room. Um, so I don't know what it's like to work with Steve Buscemi, except everybody who's worked with Steve Buscemi on Boardwalk loves him. He's, you know, he's an immensely talented, nice guy. Steve Buscemi didn't come from acting. I don't know if you know that. He was a fireman. And he just fell into acting. So he doesn't have the issues <laughs> that, that a lot of actors have. Um, uh, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of a rule um, on most, on, it's, it's not 100%, but I'd say it's about 80%. In cable te premium cable television, the writers are kings. We, we run the show. Nobody messes with us. We don't take, you know, it's great. Um, if, if you see a character get killed on one of your favorite shows, people probably didn't like him. <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> uh, 
Yes, miss. Uh, how did you like teaching at Harvard, and will you be back teaching again? <laughs> uh, I love teaching at Harvard. I had a great stroke. When they asked me to teach university, and I said I, I would much prefer uh, extension. Could I do that? And, and I did. And I'm so glad I made that choice. I loved teaching extension. I love teaching older writers. That doesn't mean they have to be in their 50s. I just mean I don't want to teach somebody who's 21 um, because it's every now and then for, for every you get a few at this age, at that age who know what they're doing, but the vast majority of them don't have any idea what they're doing. And it's gotten worse because you'll find a lot of writers now writing programs who don't read, which just blows my mind. Uh, you know, I, I remember saying this one kid in my class, you know, wh when's the last time you read a book? And he said, he's a writing student, and he said, uh, two years ago, but it was yours. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, I, I, uh, I would much rather teach somebody who knows why they're in the room. And so uh, usually Harvard Extension and graduate school programs attract people who are coming after having been in the workforce a little bit, even if it's only four years. Um, so I love that teaching experience. I can't teach right now because I don't have time. Uh, it's as simple as that. I love teaching because I ran out of time. I, I, I barely have time to do anything else. Again, I barely have time to see my friends at this point in my life. Um, Teaching takes a lot of effort. It, even if you're only teaching once a week, you still have to read manuscripts. You still have to come up with lesson plans. You still have to, you have, to have something to say. Um, it, it, there's not enough hours in my week. They're just not. I mean, you heard me describe the, uh, all the projects I got on my burner right now, and I just unloaded three. I literally just got three projects off my deck in the last three weeks, one per week. So I'm now down to, I believe, whatever I just said, juggling four. Um, so that's why I don't teach anymore. Um, will I go back to it? Um, you know, maybe. I mean, maybe when I'm older or, again, if the phone stops ringing. <laughs> uh, but I taught for 20 solid years when I didn't have to. Um, I gave back as much as I possibly could. I, I started two very successful writing programs in that time. I shored up a couple of different programs. So I think I've done, I think I've, I've given my all. Um, they can get along without me. I hope. Okay. Well, Dennis thank you Lahane, all very much. Thank you very much.